Welcome to the Alt of Blur podcast. Here, we're here to connect readers and authors so that the readers, you, can find that book or that author you're going to love. So I appreciate you being here. Get ready. Enjoy the show. Enjoy knowing the authors. And remember, subscribe. Tell people about the show. And go buy the author's books because if you like listening to them and you think they're interesting, they're going to love it. So this is Author Blur where I'm talking with Philip Ray. And Philip, the W always messes me up. So if I mispronounce your last name, forgive me. But I've been interested in you since I've heard you on another show that you did where you start talking, you talked about how you were influenced with, by Alexandra or Alexander, I can't even say his name now, Dumas. Mr. Dumas, the gentleman who wrote The Count of Monte Cristo, Three Musketeers, and a whole slew of other things. Now, you have two books that involve the musketeers. If you could help me out a bit, tell me a bit about yourself so that everyone listening and myself gets an understanding of who you are and a bit about your books. I'd be hugely appreciative. Sure. Uh, well, first, thanks for having me on. Um, I'm an attorney. I've been in practice uh, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area for over 30 years. Um, always loved the traditional mysteries, that, which would be like the Agatha Christie's, Sherlock Holmes, uh, some of the Edgar Allan Poe uh, work that was the very earliest of the mysteries. And I also uh, had well, my undergraduate degree was in French, spent some time in France and fell in love with the country. Uh, everything from the, the history to the architecture to the literature. And then within the literature, a lot of it was the Alexander Dumas work, um, which would be, as you mentioned, Count of Monte Cristo and, and Three Musketeers. And then the books that, that were sequels to the Three Musketeers. So uh, fortunately, uh, or unfortunately, as it, as it turned out, uh, when COVID hit, my work uh, travel had was uh, decreased greatly. The hearings in the courts uh, were put on hold. I had a lot of free time, more so than usual. And um, from there, I had the idea to to try to, to blend my interest of, of the traditional mysteries plus French literature and see if I could put together a, a story or a series of stories and, and see how it turned out. And that was really the genesis of uh, the books. As you mentioned, I think two books are out already. The third should be out in July, maybe June with a little luck. And then the fourth one should be out by the end of the year. All right. Now, it sounds like you are you planning on writing this whole series as long as you can, or do you have a expectation of it? I don't have an endpoint uh, for certain. It really is when I run out of ideas on it, um, which is going to happen sooner or later, but <laughs> it hasn't happened yet. Um, also, I set uh, the first book in 1636, kind of the earliest days of the Musketeers, kind of their toward toward the their heyday uh that's the same time period you'll find the musketeers in the three musketeers mm -hmm. uh, that group was shut down in 1642 or 1643 so if i if i do a book and i i set them every year or two or you know there, there's going to be a an end point naturally because the musketeers shut down at that point uh, they were later revived but so i've got i'm either going to shut down because i run out of ideas or because i hit that time uh time frame I understand now what is the basis of so like when i think of the three musketeers i've seen i've read the majority of the stories that dumas has written I haven't gone through them all, and I have no excuse for that. But I've, when I think of the Musketeers, it, weirdly enough, what pops in my head is some of the movies more than yep. the – and so I think Swashbuckling, The Adventures, all this stuff. Yours also sounds a lot like a 
a mystery trying to figure things out and is it does it go along with what Damas wrote in his Musketeers as in the swashbuckling, the sword fighting, or is it more of a detective style adventure? Well, I try to blend the two. Um, Dumas um, was more focused on the romance and the, the sword fighting. And that's what you see from the movies. I think the, the best known were probably the ones back in the seventies. Mm -hmm. um, there's been a flurry of them in the last, 15 or so years of varying quality. There's also a, a, a BBC, I think it's on BBC America, um, one called The Musketeers, which I thought was great and a little more action oriented. In right. mine, I'm trying to work it more where a musketeer, a young musketeer, um, who's a little out of step with his surroundings. He's, he's a smallish guy, a new musketeer. So he doesn't quite fit in as, as this great swordsman, but he's very bright and he's got a lot of curiosity. And as it turns out, he kind of gets involved, uh, whether he wants to or not in, uh, solving mysteries. But, because it's the Musketeers, there's their sword play in each. Uh, try to make sure I have uh, enough action to satisfy sort of that genre, but mm -hmm. also have some of the traditional detective work as well. So it, you know, it's it's for me because those are the two genres I really like. Uh, it's it's just fun to try to blend them. All right, now I know what got me into the Musketeers. What was it that pulled you into the stories and got you interested in wanting to write about that kind of storyline? Well, I always loved the books. Um, there's no question. Um, and in 2019, um, we went over to France, uh, stayed in Paris, and I'd had several trips there before. And so we wanted to do some things that maybe were a little just off the beaten path. I mean, the Louvre, the Eiffel Tower, great. You know, we want to see them every time, but it's easy to fall into the trap of going back to the same five or six big museums or monuments every trip. So we tried to look for more things that were a little off the beaten track. There, if you've ever gone, you can find a tour of just about anything, whether it's food, um, uh, you know, perfume, shopping, literature. You, you can find a tour that'll take you anywhere in the city and cover almost any topic. So I thought, well, this ought to be good. But we could find a tour that involves, you know, the Three Musketeers, because a lot of those places that were in the book, either the fictionalized places or the places that actually were there are still standing. And I thought, well, this would be neat to go and do a walking tour and see these. And there wasn't one. Hmm. So I thought, well, that's a, you know, if someone watches the podcast now, they've got an idea for a business. But I, right. I thought, well, I could put together a walking tour with these locations, do the research and, and you know, put it together. And had it all set up. I had the tour. I had hundreds of pages of research, had the photographs, and COVID hit. So before I got to the level of trying to figure out how I was going to monetize this or turn it into a, a side business, it, it kind of all got shut down and, with, and had no idea how long that was going to last. So after a few months of looking at stacks of paper of research at that time, I thought, I need to do something with it. So I thought that's what was the impetus to actually sit down and start writing. Um, right. And I, again, because I knew I liked mystery, I had now all the research on the musketeerish time, whether it's architecture, art, some of the politics that were going on. Uh, it just seemed natural. So I gave it a shot. I understand. So how historical factual is your book since you've done all this research? Well, I try to be really historically accurate. Um, you know, there's some limitations because as a, a lay person, I don't have access to some of the original documents. So you're reading secondary sources and those are not always, you know, 100% reliable. 
So I try to be as close as I can to the earliest documents. And then if there's some things I can't find, I'll either not go into as much detail or I kind of make a, a reasonable assumption of how things would have been. You know, one example is my musketeer starts as a cadet, you know, he's 17 years old, fresh off the, uh, well, not actually a farm, but a, a small, um, you know, baronet down in southern part of or middle part of France. Usually a musketeer had to spend several years in an in service in another branch of maybe the military before becoming a musketeer. But I know the youngest musketeer on record was was 12. So I got to figure he did not serve three years in a an army unit. Maybe he did. Maybe he was really advanced. But <laughs> I'm thinking because of that, there probably were exceptions either for political reasons or, or for something we just don't know now. So in that, I thought I'm comfortable enough making my guy go from his baronet to the, you know, to the musketeers without this interim stop. So, you know, some of those things I'll fudge maybe may or may not be right. But in terms of um, everything from the food, the descriptions of things, what stuff would have existed at the time, I try to make sure I'm, you know, on the mark. All right. And then what did you actually find interesting? Like, I know one thing that I've talked with some other people about on and off this podcast is that doing the research, they either discover something that is completely interesting and new to them, or they just get a um, setup where they feel kind of this is unexpected kind of a situation. Was there anything that you discovered, like the you said, 12-year-old as the youngest cadet that they've had, which to me sounds kind of weird. I think two of the things that I found interesting about or surprising about France, uh, kind of as I know it now and how I had conceptualized it in the past and, and what turned out to be the reality was just what the city was like. We tend to look at Paris and currently most of that uniform look goes back into the 1800s. Um, the city, Baron Haussmann revamped a lot of the city. Um, so if we go back earlier than that, um, you know, the, the streets were almost exclusively dirt, usually mud. Um, you had that's if people had household waste, it went out in the street. If you had uh, you know, certain days for the slaughterhouses when they did their work, that's where the blood went it, out into the street. So the mud and the filth was just, you know, pretty. It would be shocking, I think, to us now. Mm -hmm. uh, there also was no lighting. Um, people would put candles sometimes in their front windows, maybe if they were expecting someone. But other than that, people went to bed relatively early. Uh, there was no outdoor lighting. Um, it was a, so it was a very dangerous place, too. Um, the other thing that was uh, a surprise to me, and maybe it shouldn't have been, um, because I studied a lot of the history, but you know we tend to focus on Louis the Fourteenth, um, some of the, and of course Louis the Sixteenth, who you know with uh, Marie Antoinette, but mm -hmm. Henry the Fourth, who was Louis the Fourteenth's grandfather, um, was really a man of action, and he he started the, that line, the Bourbon line, um, when he became uh, king, um, and. You may need to alter that. He may not have started the line, but he came from a cadet branch of the line, um, became king. He was reported to have only read one book in his life, <laughs> but he had a vision for Paris um, about you know how to improve it. And some of the things we see now, like the Pont Neuf, which is on the, now the oldest bridge across the Seine, it had raised walkways on the side of it. Well, that was a new invention that way people could stroll uh without worrying about getting you know run over or trampled by horses or carts 
Uh, he had some big city squares that he either envisioned or had built before his assassination. That also was a new idea. And his son carried over a lot of his projects. So the city was in a transformation from a medieval town to a renaissance town, but still was in, it was pretty nasty in a lot of ways. Um, so those were things that for me made it probably a little more interesting to write about as well. All right. And then long, long answer to probably a short question. <laughs> Perfectly fine. Trust me. I love information about this kind of stuff. So let me ask this then with your first book and Forgive me, I forget which one came first and which one came second. So, but with your first book, where do we start off in the story? What is, because I know you have the, is it the murder of Pont Count? Or? Pont murders. All right. Pont Court murders. So the Pont Court murders, is that, was that the first or second of the books? That was the first. Okay. So where do we start off with that book? So if I open up and I'm just diving into it, and I'm getting ready to read. What do I expect on page one or chapter one or anything like that? I think each of my books starts with some sort of action. Just it may not be big action like in the first book it is very limited. But there is a duel that takes place at the beginning of the first book. Charles, who is my protagonist through all the stories uh, at this point, is a musketeer cadet and he gets essentially forced into a duel with a cardinal's guardsman. Duels are outlawed, um, although sometimes they would turn a blind eye to them since the the musketeers were the king's musketeers. The, the cardinal's guardsmen belonged to Richelieu. So there was a little bit of a rivalry. Well, there's not a little bit. There was a big rivalry, but also <laughs> the king and the cardinal could kind of use that to a little bit to one up each other. But there had been stories or there were situations in which duels took place and the people involved were executed. Not that I found involving a musketeer or a cardinal's guard, but with even some members of the nobility. So story starts off with Charles, you know, unsure of himself, a new musketeer cadet being forced into a duel that is technically or legally unlawful. And as a result, he gets sent by his superior to do a prisoner transfer, to go to a rural village, pick up someone who's been accused of, of murdering a family, bring them back to bring that person back to Paris for trial. And that's how it all gets started. Something to just to get him out of the way. But then once he gets into the, that village, he starts to suspect there's more to the story than um, kind of the official version of, of what has taken place. And All right. from there starts his investigation. All right. Sounds good. So we start off with some action. We get ready to just see some of the traditional musketeer entering. And then, like you said, we go into the mystery. Is this... I guess here's the one question with some mysteries. Is it a you hint and you lead through and all this to people trying to figure out what actually happened? Or do you do the style of where you introduce the villain, you introduce everybody up front, and then you work to the defeat of the villain or the, res the resolve the, the wrongdoing? You, my books tend to follow more of a traditional Agatha Christie approach, which is a number of potential suspects are brought to light and the protagonist has to work his way through them you know, as he's trying to figure out which one is the, the actual killer. Um, so you don't really, you're not looking at it as from the killer's perspective at any point. You don't know who the killer is. Well, hopefully you don't know, but there's <laughs> clues that that would, you know, can lead you to it um, or lead you to, I should say, him or her. Um, 
as uh, as you go through, but it's it's more of the traditional. And I try to be fair about it, where it's not something that I introduce a last you know a new character in the last chapter, where there's no way you would know of that person, or or some squirrely fact that absolutely there's nothing that would lead you to pick up on that, you know. Um, so that I think they call it a fair play. Um, murder mystery where the facts are laid out, the suspects are laid out, and you know the the reader goes along with the protagonist trying to solve it. Okay, so I guess I, I always refer to it as the clue style. You know everybody there. It's figuring out who did it by the end of the the game or the end of the story. So with that, you wrote that you did that. And you decided to continue on, and you're using Charles in that one as well. What is what does that lead us into? Well, the good thing is they each book, again, with the idea of kind of the Agatha Christie style, each book is a standalone, like you know, a Hercule Poirot book. It really doesn't matter if you pick up book 30 in the series and read it. And then go back to book 15. They do have some a little bit of building on each other in, in her books. Mine builds on you know facts or or relationships, maybe a little more, but each is a standalone. And it, by the second book, Charles is is starting to come into his own, at least getting his feet under him. You know, he's he's had you know his his first adventure, and he's given a little more authority, a little more. Um, um, oh, I don't know what you would call it, responsibility, I guess, in the second book. And in the third book, it's a little more. And, uh, right. you know, that's, so it, it, they progress, but the point is they can be read really in any order, although I try to flow through, you know, with introducing characters and bringing those characters along from one story to the next. All right, now, I know a lot of stories they filter backstories and history throughout book one, two, and so on. Do you do that as well, or is it just we meet Charles in the first book and the second, so we don't get confused if we read two about a backstory that might affect the story? Does that make sense? Yeah. I'm, I'm, no, I'm not 100% <laughs> sure what you're All right, asking. So, let, so just as a theory theory to put out there say charles had an event in his childhood that you mentioned in book one and right. that event affects how he looks at things or affects things that he says or what so have you say it's an like him and his father traditional backstory is the father got killed and he wanted to make his father proud that's why he does all this stuff and you talk a little bit about that in the book one, the first book you put out, just as an example. And in right. book two, one thing that I've read in some books where they always say, oh, they can be read in any order. You read book two or three and he talks, well, you know about my father. So this is and you're kind of like, well, sure. no, I don't know about the father. Yeah, I try to. So. And you're not terribly far from wrong on your guess on the first book. So, you know, he, Charles has issues with his father. Um, that's part of why he, you know, if you're the third son of a minor noble and a minor noble that doesn't have a lot of money at that, you know, that's, you know, musketeer is a pretty good job for you. Um, and that's, you know, because of his conflict with his father, um, that's in part why he ends up becoming a musketeer. Um, and that we have some direct confrontation with the father in the book and whether it resolves or not, I'll let, I won't, won't spoil that. But then in the second book, some of the things, you know, carry over, you know, but I try not to just drop it in where you're expected to know, oh, he had, he had some issue with his father and move on from there. I, I will make some reference. I'm not going to go back and and recite everything, but I'm definitely going to bring give the reader enough that they need to know 
um, kind of what's driving him or how that may be affecting his, his outlook on things. Um, and kind of, I kind of go from there. I will do a little bit of, you know, how does he know how to do this? Well, I'm, I might make reference to a, a prior mystery or something he was involved in, you know, just like in this case in which that happened, you know, this is how he, how that's affected him or caused him to have a either um, an additional skill or maybe changed his outlook in the current book. Again, I don't necessarily go back and say, here was the bad guy. He caught him by doing this. But I talk about some of the um, maybe some of the facts or some of the investigation, if that makes sense. It does. So what I'm understanding is if I read book two first, and I'm just saying book two is in the order they came out. If I read book two first, there'll be things. So if I go and read book one after that, I can sit there and have a, oh, that calls back to what he said there. So there's a correlation, but it's not giving you spoilers for the prior book or another book. Right, right. I, and I try to, I try to keep it like that and try to give enough information that the person can read it and understands maybe some of the motivations or how does he know how to do this without just regurgitating everything that happened in the previous book to, to bring him up to speed. And I think from the, some of the readers I talked to who did read them out of order, they didn't think they didn't find there to be a problem, which was good. I mean, obviously that's what I was going for. Right. Um, and so you know, there was, there were some things that my editors or my editor, excuse me, had talked about on the second and then on the third book saying, I don't know that we need to go into this much detail on this past event. Maybe just touch on it and, and go from there. So, All right. Now, here's one thing that I do get kind of interested about on books like the, yours is, like you said, Dumas did, and I might be mispronouncing his name, I've always said it Dumas, but Dumas, when he wrote The Three Musketeers, like you said, he had romance, he built the characters with flaws. I think, I forget which one it was, but there's one that was just very much into women, another Aaron. one, yes, yeah. and I think it was D'Artagnan who was the he was a king's man without question, if I'm remembering correctly. It's been a while since I've gotten into the story, so if I get them out of order. Sure. But what I'm getting at is that they all had their focus and their faults. And if you call it a fault a or a um, clutch that they grabbed onto, does Charles have that same issue or is it – He's pretty straight laced in your stories. Yeah, he's he struggles with things definitely. You know, I, another series I read that's completely out of my genre is the Jack Reacher series. I love yep. those, but Jack Reacher's basically perfect. He can <laughs> right. beat anyone up. It takes him like ten seconds to figure out everything that's going on. You know, fun to read, probably not terribly realistic. <laughs> you know, at least for most people I've met. Charles is more, you know, he's, he's, like I said, he's, he's a little bit, he's just out of step with, uh, you know, those around him. He's, he's a good, you know, becomes a good swordsman, but he's not great. He's very, you know, he's pretty academic for that time, but there's still a lot of stuff he doesn't know. He was limited by being someone who's from that century. Um, so and he you know so he he struggles especially in the first book with um, this issue with his dad wanting to prove himself. Uh, he's got concerns about finances. Just I mean he's a, he's a normal seventeen year old guy, kind of thrust into a position that maybe is a little beyond him, and so he he struggles his way through that. The second book. You know, he, he's got his feet under him a little more, but he still has some issues, whether it's, you know, how to deal with women, how to how to deal with in the second book. He has to um, uh, do the investigation along with a cardinal uh, cardinal guardsman. So how do you 
how do you work together with someone that you are kind of inherently disposed to, to hate? Uh-huh. Um, you know, things like that. Um, you know, the th- third book, not to get too spoiler ish, but he has an issue where he's becoming a little too uh, confident in his abilities that he thinks I can figure these things out. I'm I'm getting smarter than everyone. And, you know, has that re- results in some additional problems. So, um, you know, I, I, I try to write him more as I vaguely remember being a 17 year old. You know, <laughs> I try to write him a little bit like that, where you're, you've got some ideas on things, but you're not always right. I understand. Now, here's one thing also with the historical factors of it is I know back in the times of the the king the, like the monarchy time of France and the medieval the renaissance all that 17 how they acted the way they lived was much different than either 17 when we were kids and what so have you especially 17 now do you take into factor when you're writing this as a 17 year old character that he's forced to be more mature, more adult. He's not worrying about, I have this, or I can do this. The immaturity that still hunts, hunts you when you're 17, 18, early twenties. Yeah. I, I, I try to write it as if, you know, I were seeing things at that time, which, you know, and, and some of that comes from reading a lot of books on history of that time. You know, um, now he's in the lowest level of the nobility. He's, he's you know, a fairly impoverished noble. That's still a lot better than being the average, you know, slaughterhouse worker at the right. time. Um, so there are certain things that he, you know, that are, that are kind of common struggles. Like, how am I going to, how am I going to make money now? It's not, how am I going to make money to live? It's like, how am I going to make money so I can afford to go out and and party with the other nobles, you know? Um, If I do try to take some of that into account um, in terms of the relationships, in terms of, you know, his, his servant, how would they have interacted um, and I did fudge a little on that. I make his servant and, and, and Charles a little closer to being equals in part because of, you know, modern sensibilities. You know, Dumas, his characters will have it. Oh, you're not beating your servant enough. So come over here and, <laughs> you know, I'm going to whack you with a stick. I just don't think that's, you know, that may have been the way it was at the time. I just don't know that the modern reader is going to read that and, you know, think much of it. So bottom line is I try to make things as historically accurate as I can in terms of, you know, what would have been motivating them, what, you know, how they would have reacted to events around them, that sort of thing. All right. Now, speaking of nobility, because again, going back to that time frame, nobility, like people have, like I, I have an understanding and I'm not an expert by the by counts and the counts and the dukes and the standings of each one and third earl or whatever it is. Do you go in and do you use the nobility titles very often or explain those in any way? A little bit. Um, you know, for instance, uh, Charles's sort of best friend within the Musketeers is the son of a, a viscount. So. So much much higher up the nobility chain. Now, I don't go into detail explaining, okay, there's a, a baron and a marquis, then a viscount, then a count, you know, or whatever, and then a duke. Right. I don't do a lot of that, but I'll make it known that someone is the son of this, which is much higher on, you know, and they'll make a comment, you know, they, uh, you're you're much higher on the on the ladder than I am get the point across but not just belabor the like the intricacies of uh, of society the second book involves a murder of a noble person and so 
I think I try to get it across by just saying, you know, he can command the people to come to have dinner at his place. And maybe they can't, don't feel like they have the ability to turn him down because he is a, a count or he's a marquee. Um, so I get, I, you know, I try to work it in like that without being too much turning it into a, you know, a, a textbook on the hierarchy. All right. So we don't get beaten down by history, but we do know history and ranks Hopefully. and all that. That's what I'm going for. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. And that's fantastic. Those are the kinds I do enjoy, too. You know, and, and there's a kind of along with that, because this is set in France, you just kind of want to give the reader a reminder of that. I mean, it's it's you know it, but you want to get them from a reminder. So I will use, you know, the occasional French word, but it's usually going to be something like, you know, bonjour or, you know, <laughs> some, some, you know something pretty common. And if I do use a phrase where maybe a saying or something, I'll usually repeat it back. You know, I should have an example at hand, but I don't. Um, but, you know, one character will say something and the other guy will say, well, yeah, for you, it's good that that. But what about for me? And, you know, so I try to make it where you don't have to go find a, a, a you know, a dictionary to, you know, to figure it out either. Either it's clear from the context, it's a common word, or another character is going to interact with that phrase and, and make it clear. All right. Now, here's one thing that I do like to know as well is, so you have a background as a lawyer. Now, as a lawyer, I've talked with a couple lawyers on here, and they do bring in their lawyer backgrounds or their law background into the stories so that they can throw a little bit more, I guess, quality or I don't know the term I'm thinking of. And I always hate when you're trying to say something, you can't remember the exact word. But basically, authenticity, that's what I was looking for. Do you do that in this or do you leave it at just a story and leave the law that you know behind? Well, I think I leave behind the law as I know it, but in terms of um, the idea of logic, um, you know, looking at documents, being able to try to figure things out, that carries over. So Charles has a little bit of that streak um, where he probably would make a decent lawyer today. Um, in a sense that he's he's got a fairly logical mind. He usually catches on to things, uh, you know, relatively quickly. Uh, but I also looked back at um, some books that were written around that time. And the, the legal process, I've got it uh, to some extent sprinkled through different books where I can at least touch on sort of how how things work with someone who's charged with a crime at that time, you know, how uh, how the police or wasn't the police at the time, but essentially the police or the magistrates would have conducted their investigations and then the, potentially the trial. So I probably do still bring some of the ideas in without it being, you know, something, you know, directly related to my my work. All right. Although I did, I do have a guy who gets uh trampled by a cow and gored and has uh, has a lung that is punctured. Um, and I had just worked on a case involving that situation. So it was, it was nice to be able to say, oh, I know exactly what this is like, you know. So. Well, that would be an interesting situation. I mean, I grew up in around enough cows and horses that I know that wouldn't be a fun thing to have happen to you. So... No. So here's something. Out of everything you've heard back from people on your books, your editors, readers, whoever it might be, what's the one thing you've had somebody tell you about your books that you, one, never thought about it and you found interesting or good or what so have you? You know, one thing that in terms of what's been most gratifying, I've had several people who have either told me, um, 
or written me and said, you know, I and these are people that I either know closely or at least I, I know them. I've met them somewhere along the way. Um, and they said, you know, I, I don't read. This is the first book I've read in 10 or 15 years. And I really enjoyed it. And I didn't know anything about France. Um, and I, I, I learned a lot from the book. And I think, well, that's really, that's really cool. I was just trying to write something entertaining, you know, something that I would like to read. So I think that's been good. Um, you know, some things you get, uh, you know, had generally pretty good reviews on both of them. Um, and, and I, it, it confirms kind of that I accomplished some of what I was going for, which is trying to be more, like I said, kind of Agatha Christie ish in a sense mm -hmm. that there was not, there's not going to be four pages of me describing a room. It's going to be stripped down to, you know, some description, but try to have it either more dialogue or action driven. And so the book will click along at a faster pace. I think that that helps the person get who's reading it get through it without having to go wait a minute well who is that character again you know what why does why does he have this or that and have to dig back through the the book i want it to be a little more a little more linear and clean all right and i think i think i've accomplished that we'll see well it sounds like you have from what you're telling me so that that's a good thing there now Finally, before I let you go, what's the what's the one thing that really do you enjoy about writing on these stories? You know, it's I am not the biggest planner in the world. Um, I'm definitely, that's that's a way <laughs> that's way an understatement. Um, I have an idea usually where the story is going to go, who who the bad guy is how the killing took place and a lot of the stuff in between, I don't really know when I get started and I usually start building it out as I go and think, okay, I got to have, got to have a clue somewhere around this chapter. I've got to have some kind of action scene, whether it's a chase or a fight somewhere in here to keep the pace going. And I, to me, I guess it's a little bit surprising sometimes how the story develops you know, makes almost I can almost be like a reader at part thinking, oh, that's that's kind of neat, you know, and it's nothing that I really planned. It just sort of happens in the moment. And that 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 can be a lot of fun. Um, All right. So it's basically as you're writing it, you're discovering the story as you go. Yeah. Like I said, I'll have a, a really thin skeleton of it <laughs> with a few major plot points. But there's a lot that I'm not sure of how I'm going to get there. And I do like the fact, I, I like the research stuff. In the fourth book, there's quite a bit of, um, uh, they, call, they call it jeu de palm, which is, means palm, palm game, kind of like handball. But by this time they were using paddles. It's kind of a, a predecessor to indoor tennis. Didn't know anything about that. But that's become part of that just because I stumbled across that and read some on it, it's become something that's sprinkled throughout the story and it has some importance, you know? So it's, it's just fun that to me, not to a lot of people maybe, but to <laughs> me, it's a lot of, a lot of fun reading about, well, how do you know if the ball went over? If they didn't have a net, they just had a string. How do you know if it went over or under? What happens? You know, who makes the call? You know, just stuff like that. Yeah. I could see the fun and interest in that. I mean, Anytime you learn something, at least for me, learning is always an entertainment portion of thing. So with that being said, I don't want to take up too much of your time today. I, I Like we discussed before we started this interview, I'm grateful you came on. I was interested in you from when I've heard you on another show. That's why I reached out to you, and I'm glad you came on. So people can find a profile of you on authorblurb.com. They can go there, see your books, see some information about you. But if they want to reach out to you, if they want to find out more about you, where would you like them to go? My website is up, but currently undergoing construction. It's still viewable, but it's not terribly great right now. But it's just Philip with two L's, Ray, 
W-R-A-Y.com. There is a Philip Ray author who writes stuff that I don't understand. <laughs> so that's that's not if you find yourself reading, you know, some kind of you know obscure tract, that's not me. You're in the wrong, <laughs> wrong guy's site. Um and then you know, just uh, email me also, Philip Ray author at gmail.com. I'm always happy to hear from people. I do, you know, a lot of stuff. I mean, whether it's, I'm starting to do more book signings, I've done some, some book clubs, talk to, talk to people, some just answered questions, you know, how to, it seems like everyone has a story in them they'd like to, to get out. And I'm mm-hmm. happy to tell them all the things that work for me and things that didn't. So. Well, perfect. So, Hopefully people find your books, find them as interesting that I'm finding them and I'm looking forward to reading them. Personally, like I said, I enjoy the Musketeers and Count of Monte Cristo and that type of air. So I'm definitely looking forward to getting to having your books on my reading list. Philip, thank you again for being here. I'm going to have you hold on for me for a moment. We're going to end the conversation for everybody else, but for you and I, we'll talk a little bit more. All right. Well, thank you very much. You can go to authorblurb.com where there's plenty of stuff there for you to find. Enjoy another author. Enjoy finding that book that you love. So take the time. Do me a favor. Share. Subscribe. Enjoy the show and tell others. Thank you.